this webcast for the History and Context of Journalism. The topic for today is existentialism. My name is Catherine Hayes and I'm here with Chris Horry who's just given a talk on the subject and some second year journalism students. It seemed like a, a massive topic, so if you were to sum it up, what would you say, Chris? It's a, it's a, it is a massive topic and therefore very difficult to sum up, but in practical terms it's a renewed interest in the dilemmas of personal choice, of the moral consequences of the deci of decisions that we make in life, um, both for our own moral good, if you like, for our own moral well-being, our own sense of ourselves, and for its implications on society. It's a doctrine essentially of very extreme personal uh, responsibility and that comes I think from its intrinsic atheism we've previously been discussing Nietzsche and his atheism but in a world where there is no God where there is no uh, pre-existing moral system um, a world that's eff effectively pointless we're left with this dilemma of what to make of that uh, and how to construct a morality really for ourselves with with very few pointers so it, it's rather a, a troubling way of looking at the world but I always think there's two sides to it it's 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 a frightening doctrine in many ways the the idea of existential angst of constant worry about uh, of what we should be doing with this brief span of life as they see it that we have how not to waste it how not to uh, cause uh, lots of problems for other people but it's also a great liberation at the same time because there are no pre-existing moral standard that's a proposition there's no there's no particular thing you should be doing with your life really um, you it's a liberation uh, to, to make your own life to create rules for yourself and, and to try and live by the, those rules very liberating I think to groups that we thought uh, traditionally were oppressed in society, particularly in the very stuffy world of 19th century you know, Victorian imperialist uh, European society. So for black people, for women, for gay people, for people who uh, experience uh, constant sort of really prejudice, it, it, it can be a liberation because at the core of it is the idea of existence is everything that people do not have essences. As you don't have to behave in this particular way or that particular way because you're a student or because you're a, a gypsy or because you're a man or you're a woman. That it's frightening on, on one level, but life is there to be made and it will be made for you if you don't make it yourself. OK, so how, how can we relate all this to journalism, Chris? I think in terms of journalism, you've got to look at two things. One is the way in which I think existentialism has invaded popular culture. It's absolutely everywhere. In advertising, for example, there's this constant thing that's coming from billboards and advertising of just do it, be yourself, consume this product and change your life. You can change your life. It's a kind of commercialized, institutionalized existentialism all the time. It's there constantly. So it's there in the popular culture all the time. So if you look at the Brit Awards and you see Lady Gaga, there she is, she's determining herself. If she wants to look like that in that extraordinary way, then, then she can and she can't really be criticised. In fact, she's lionised for being a complete individual, a one-off, somebody who lives her life uh, by her own lights in the spirit of complete freedom. That's the commercial pitch of that, whether that's sincere or not is another matter. So constantly in the culture, existentialism is there, the ethic of existentialism. Secondly, more directly, some of the greatest journalists of the, of the 20th century, the 21st century is really too young yet to look back on the canon of journalists, were explicitly existentialist in their approach. Albert Camus himself, who we looked at, was a journalist. And the whole trend that we saw in a movement in the 1960s called the New Journalism, associated with people like Joan Didion, um, Hunter S. Thompson, Tom Wolfe, was to try and see people as completely uh, undetermined bundles of possibility, to see them constantly with fresh eyes. Um, 
to to try and report on situations with no preconditions with no preconceptions so to immerse ourselves as journalists it's called gonzo journalism to immerse ourselves in situations and write about the actual reality of how people are behaving without these preconceptions another great uh master of this i think he was the greatest journalist of the 20th century he often appears in such lists was the polish journalist ryzard kapuczynski who we'll look at in some more detail and he's very interested he goes in, he was a foreign reporter for the polish uh, press service and he writes about the third world and he's interested in ritual and ritual behavior and just minutely detailing what some people think is the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. So there's a direct intellectual input, particularly into feature writing, uh, this whole observational, we've discussed that, the observational form of journalism. Very cool, very just saying, well, this is what people do, and just presenting it to people, that, that, that's that been massive. And secondly, it's everywhere in pop culture. Everywhere. Everyone's an existentialist these days. So um, to be an existentialist, uh, if you want to free yourself, you need to have a passionate commitment to something, and that can be anything. That's right. The kind of existential heroes, existential saints, are people who are completely, unreasonably, passionately, madly committed to something. They know it's a sort of self-conscious act of being committed to something, um, but to do something in a moderate way, particularly just to please others or to fit in, is a kind of existential sin. The only way to free yourself from all this angst is to have this compulsion, this overriding desire to do something. So existential love affair has to be unbelievably romantic. So when that comes up in the drama and the movies, people are you know, like uh, Vincent van Gogh, that they'll cut their ears off and everything like that. They're so passionate to, to make this a fair work. It's all-consuming. Or in music, a, a character like John Coltrane, for example, who taught himself by circular breathing to be able to play saxophone solos four hours long, exploring every single possible note. Uh, and total abandonment, when, when uh, I've seen film of Coltrane playing, total passionate abandonment, to the moment now, spontaneity, uh, it, uh, that kind of free jazz, not interested in the least bit about the audience, just there in the moment performing with absolute rhapsodic passion. That is existentialist heaven. Existentialist hell is doing anything just because you have to. I mean, we, I mean, an existentialist has to compromise with the world and earn a living, but somebody who just went and worked in a shop or something forever uh, and just thought, oh, I, I'm just going to have this modest life and get through life and die and not do anything. Th those kind of people are the people that the existentialists don't like and they worry about them and they think that there are bad implications about that, which I, I think Veronica has a question wh which, will, which will segue with that. Yes, I was wondering, um, how about Nazis? They were passionate about what they were doing. What is um, what is the existentialist take on that? Well, there there were two great totalitarian horrors of the of the twentieth century: Stalinist communism and uh, Nazism. And the existentialists are very well, centrally concerned with both of those. Partly because of the times, Jean Paul Sartre himself lived through the war. Um, I think he was an, he was a prisoner. He was a German prisoner of war for a while, and he wrote while he was a a prisoner and it was the experience of being a prisoner which is uh, where you're completely determined by others yes I've been in cells overnight I'm um, not uh, for not very serious crimes uh, to do with football and that years ago and um, it is very 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 punishing to be in a cell because you are totally determined you realize there is nothing you can do to create your life while you're in that cell nothing at all that the door is shut there is no handle and if they all go away or forget about you, then that's you're done. So he was a prisoner, he, the, the, uh, and you know, the, the, the absolute horror of prison and being determined by other people. Now, on Nazism, they're interested in collaboration. 
Now it's true that maybe the leading Nazis, uh, like Goebbels in particular, was saw himself as a kind of artist, as a kind of passionate person, like the artist of lying, like his <laughs> his way of performing was just to lie, the big lie, to to manipulate people on a massive scale by telling any lie against any unpopular group to incite a crowd. Um, that is bad faith. That is the unforgivable thing in this existential moral thing, to manipulate people for your own pleasure, um, to deny their own life, uh, and also the dishonesty in that. Um, now, the average Nazi was not passionate. There's a tremendous book we'll look at by Hannah Ardent called On Totalitarianism, and she, she is within this intellectual milieu, and she talks about the banality of evil. How the Nazi thing happened was people just went to work, same as they uh, read lies in the newspapers, they knew there were lies, they, but they didn't want to get into trouble, they didn't want to be sacked, they didn't want to lose their, their job here. And, and so society went on and wh while this mass murder was going on. So it's the banality of evil. The one thing that worries me is this presentation that comes through the History Channel and kind of school teacher Nazis, that they were all mad, they were all mad all the time. No, they were just being normal. They were getting married, having kids, going to work, driving trams, making little components for the gas chamber, but not the whole gas chamber. And the, the Nazis were rather clever at dividing responsibility. So everyone says, it's not my fault, I'm, I'm just uh, printing the newspaper that contains the lies, <laughs> that means that nobody objects when they round up the Jews. And it's not my fault, I only made the, uh, the, um, the tin cans that the gas went in. Yeah. So the banality of evil. Communism uh, was also something that worried him. The, the, uh, Sartre himself was a member of the Communist Party. I think Albert Camus had been. Uh, communism was the great hope. It was the great hope of Western civilization. It was the thing that came down the train lines from the Enlightenment. It was supposedly based on science, on reason, on equality, on rights, on fairness, on, in Nietzschean terms, even in, in evolving in a social way to the future. It turned into the biggest mass slaughter, second only to uh, the, the Nazi thing, and some people say bigger than the Nazi thing. And how are they coping with that? How could something that they believed in so passionately and was so good have turned out to be so bad? So, again, uh, the way that people collaborated in the, in the Nazi... We've looked at that in connection with George Orwell. How can people... There are stories in the Stalinism that people would denounce their own children, denounce their own friends uh, uh, to, to the political pol police just to be accepted, just to say... You, you know, people say, you're not very good communist, you haven't denounced anybody this week. So they denounce somebody just for that. And the whole system ran on bad faith. Um, so passionate. The Nazis were not passionate. Um, they, they for Hitler to be passionate. He was certainly charismatic. He was certainly charismatic, but he's in front of rows and rows and rows of obedient conformist people. Uh, and if there was just one mad guy, like Zarathustra, wandering about in Winchester town centre shouting nonsense at people, then that's not a problem. That's rather a good thing. If he'd, stuck it, if, he, if he'd left it at that, he might even be a kind of admirable figure. But the fact that millions and millions of people were prepared to conform, Nazism is all about conformity, not about millions of individual passionate nutcases. They wouldn't have got it together to, to, to organise uh, uh, what they did. If, 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 uh, so existentialism also prizes individualism. Yes. In fact, mass passion, mass hysteria, is something they're very scared of. Now, I like football, and I like th the loss of the self that I experience in a football crowd. But that is bad faith. I enjoy it, but it's existential bad faith. I do do it um, because I am no longer being an individual. I'm being passionate, but in a crowd, and that's bad. But my excuse is th these concrete bowls were, b were built to do that. If you want to do that, just go in there. If you don't want to do it, leave it alone. We're not planning, we football maniacs, uh, to run the country or conquer China or anything like that. We just go in there and we do this rather disgraceful thing of um, bad faith, of hating people just for fun.
as a kind of leisure activity. Um, at the start of the talk, you uh, mentioned that the existential outlook on life is pessimistic and bleak, but we're talking about concepts such as passion, um, potential and liberty. So could you explain that conflict of ideas? Yeah, uh, I think that there are two two sides to it. Um, if, if I said it's all just pessimistic and bleak, then I think that that uh, was um, a mistake or I didn't get my point across. Uh, once you realise that you are alone, really, in the ultimately existentialism says you are alone. Nobody is going to ultimately care about you. Nobody is going to solve your problems. Nobody, don't wait around for somebody else to liberate you. Yes. Now that is a harsh and um, difficult thing to come to terms with. It's they have this idea of angst which is a literal feeling of unease, a kind of sickness in the stomach, when you contemplate the horribleness of that in a way. I think it's very much part of growing up because uh, your parents lie to you for good reasons, though, for good faith, you know, to protect you. They tell you, uh, <coughs> Father Christmas, and don't worry about this and that. Uh, part of growing up, really, is facing f this existential problem, that you don't have much time, that People won't do your life for you. In fact, they may try and take over your life and make your life part of their life. <laughs> and then you're going to have, you know, what are you going to do with this, this time that you've got, you've got in front of you? There are Christian existentialists such as Kierkegaard who address the same problem. That if you're going to, uh, uh, the, the Christian existentialists see life as a test. It's been set for you by God. Can you reach a kind of self-contentment by your moral actions or are you going to go through eternity in a kind of hell which is realising you sh shouldn't have driven a taxi in Dachau <laughs> in, you know you shouldn't have done that and you're going to have worry you know, you're going to have angst about that for, forever uh, and the way Christian existentialists like Kierkegaard see it is that you constantly have to live in good faith you have to do the right thing all the time not just because you want to fit in with people, then you will be content with yourself and you won't have, you won't torture yourself. Mm. Okay, have we got any more questions? Uh, you touched upon this briefly in the lecture um, and you said earlier about uh, Coltrane and jazz. Yeah. Um, you've explained it in music, but what about art and literature? Um, where can we find examples of exis uh, existentialism in, in art and literature? Art, literature, and theatre. So, and theatre, yeah, yes. Uh, I think that Beckett's plays, uh, Waiting for Godot, Crap's Last Tape, uh, and uh, people like P Harold Pinter, uh, you, you know his plays where uh, pe thing, nothing happens. You know, th there's one called The Caretaker, where the man's trying to hire somebody to be a caretaker, and there's all these pregnant pauses, and it's absolutely agony to watch it because they don't know the right thing to say. Everything's embarrassing. Abigail's Party, have you ever seen that one? It's like an existential hell. See that. Uh, Abigail's Party, hell is other people. It's a polite dinner party, uh, but they all hate, they don't like each other, and they're terribly gauche all the time. And they're kind of maybe, they're flirting with each other, but it's absolutely excruciatingly embarrassing all the time. So I think in drama, you see existentialism in jazz and in improvisation generally. So uh, you see it in formal uh, academic music like Stockhausen and so on, or John Cage or something like that where they improvise. Um, you see it in uh, poetry, of course. Uh, um, I can't think immediately of any good examples of that. Um, and in the novel, in the novel of characters who who are undetermined um, and in the cult in popular culture of the psychopath the person who has no past no moral structure they just react suddenly and unpredictably all the time you see characters like that all the time uh, in uh, modern literature in the 60s 70s and 80s and in popular culture there's a popular novel every student used to read in the old days called the dice man um, where a man lives just by rolling the dice all the time. So you say that um, existential behaviour can happen in 
things that contain order. Such so, so say there's a symphony um, and it's a very old symphony. If something went wrong or someone improvised, would that be considered an existential uh, move, or is it not something that can be measured? Uh, existentialism in formal music. Messian, the composer Messian, uh, and also John Cage. Uh, Messian wrote the, uh, I'm doing this from memory, not from notes, wrote the uh, uh, Suite for the End of Time, which is an attempt to imagine nothingness in the music. It's very boring. It, a lot of existential art production is concerns boredom and nothing, you know, nothingness. Uh, and then there's John Cage, who wrote music with uh, random symbols, random symbols on the uh, on the stave, and the and the uh, musician had to react to that symbol in the moment. Yes, uh, existentialism isn't well suited to the technology of the 19th century symphony orchestra. 19th century symphony orchestra was. Um, devised for romantic music yes um hot hot music where where beethoven was trying to tell you something about prometheus cool music i'm using marshall McLuhan's terms now is where it's determined by by the um the listener so a lot of electronic music is like that uh because uh for example Kraftwerk, if you know about them if you go to their website they let you compose the music and yourself and you interact with the music and all the rest of it. There's kind of ambient music from New York and that where there are sensors, that it, it makes tones and there are sensors in the room and the tone of the music changes according to your position in the room and things. So it's radically subjective in, in art generally. Existential is massive. So you've got this kind of weird New York, very strange kind of if people who live in a loft and they wear black clothes and they've got lots of stuff going on with synthesize music synthesizers and they just read Nietzsche and say random things and stab stab themselves in the arm and things take lots of heroin as well heroin's the big drug of existentialism okay Chris have you got anything to add on the subject uh, yes well we could talk about it all night but uh, I don't think we're ever going to re reach much of a conclusion about this but uh, anybody else want to have a go at it Anybody? Can I ask a question? Do, do people find existentialism interesting? Yeah, definitely very interesting. Um, listening to the lecture earlier, it, um, it's something that I could relate to perhaps more than other subjects that we've covered, like Nietzsche and uh, Orwell, perhaps. Um, I was going to ask a question about Nietzsche as well, because I know we've been um, focusing heavily on him the last few weeks. Um, how can we relate existentialism to, to the German philosopher and other similar figures? Existentialism to German to idealism, philosophical idealism. You mean? No, sorry, no, sorry to uh, to, Nietzsche. To, to Nietzsche and yeah. uh, figures like Kant. Yeah, uh, well, Kant comes before Nietzsche, but uh, Kant and Nietzsche hate each other. Oh, 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 sorry, Kant wasn't aware of Nietzsche. Nietzsche comes much later. Kant, Nietzsche doesn't like uh, Kant's system of general morality that everybody has the same moral system, etc., etc. The existentialists are like that. There's a lot of paranoia in existentialism. Solipsistic, meaning solipsism is a word from philosophy. It's the view that only I exist and everybody else is like a figment of my imagination. And sometimes existentialism, I think, slides towards solipsism, that hell is other people and other people don't really exist and I can just reimagine these people as something else. Um, but uh, for, the, for Nietzsche and the existentialists, there are no general moral systems. You make your own moral system, and everybody has a relative system of morality. Existential justice, for example, if there was such a thing, if it, you know, our justice system was based upon it, would be very, very different. Pe some people would be allowed to get away with m literally with murder. Yes, in an existential, if a justice system based on existential philosophy existed, you could claim, well, I stole all this stuff, but I really needed it. Uh, for a good reason, and and you would get off. Now, sometimes I think people, that, you know, because existentialism has gone into the public, do think that. I think there is a conflict between our formal legal system and uh, 
and the popular culture, which is all a, is very influenced now by existentialism. There's a very interesting book called The Corruption of Character by Richard Sennett, which is about this, saying we've got this legal system that's based on old-fashioned 18th century concepts of rights and law and everything like that. But the population is actually rather existentialist. They'd like to go out and crucify the paedophiles, but let off people who do driving offences and things. So that's, you know, that's very, this, this growing subjectivism in the culture is having a corroding effect at least Richard Sennett is saying, on our formal institutions. It's certainly having a massive corroding effect on education, for example. OK, I think that's all we've got time for today. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for that discussion. We always welcome your comments and contributions, which can be made on Winchester Journalism YouTube page or on our blogs or message board, which can be found at www.journalism.winchester.ac.uk or simply by typing Winchester Journalism into Google.